Welcome to everyone to the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories session today, our ongoing leadership series supported by Zonta International. I thank you most sincerely for coming on, online today and to welcome our very special guest, Holly Ransom. I'm Lynn Foley, Chairman of the Zonta International Leadership Development Committee, and it's an honour and a privilege to host this series. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also pay that respect to any First Nations people present. Sondra International is a leading global organisation of professionals empowering women worldwide through service and advocacy. Sondra is now in its second century and has more than 28,000 members in 68 countries working together to make gender equality a worldwide reality for women and girls. Since 1923, Zonta International has provided more than 41.2 million US dollars to empower women and girls and expand their access to education, healthcare, economic opportunities and safe living conditions. So welcome, Holly. It's now my pleasure to introduce you through your bio and I know you're coming to us today from Melbourne, Australia. Welcome. Thank you, Lynn. Holly's a glow with you and the Zonta family. Yeah, thanks very much. And you are part of our Zonta family, absolutely. Um, Holly is a globally renowned content curator, a powerful speaker and a master questioner with a belief that if you walk past it, you tell the world it's okay. Having interviewed the likes of Barack Obama, Richard Branson, Billie Jean King and Condoleezza Rice, Holly fights complexity with that curiosity. She fights apathy with empowerment and fear with fact. Soon to release her book, the leading edge, and that date is the 20th of July, I now know. Uh, Holly helps people harness their own potential to lead by asking better questions, thinking beyond biased answers and building collective momentum for change. I feel like I'm in absolute company, excellent company today, Holly, in doing, um, if you like, a conversation with you off the back of the powerful people you have interviewed. So, I'll just add a little bit more to Holly's bio before we get going. Herself an accomplished company director, Holly has compressed a power-packed career into a decade spanning corporate, non-profit and public sectors. As founder and CEO of consulting firm Emergent, Holly's led real-world results with clients such as P&G, Microsoft, Virgin, Cisco and KPMG. Holly's track record demonstrates success in developing strategic policy frameworks that balance economic and commercial interests with social and ethical ramifications. Holly has a wealth of awards behind her and it all started, I think, back in 2014 when she was asked to co-chair the G20 Youth Summit, which was held here in Australia, followed by the United Nations Coalition of Young Women Entrepreneurs in 2016 and becoming the youngest director to be appointed to an Australian football club. So there are many more. Holly has a podcast called Coffee Pods, which I'm sure you can find on your favourite podcast uh, location, and is a LinkedIn influencer and a credible content producer by the Australian Com Institute of Company Directors. And recently, I know Holly's just graduated from the Harvard Kennedy School Class of 21 Fellow, and she's been the recipient of the prestigious Anne Wexler Public Policy Scholarship. So the passion for social and economic inclusion that sees her today specialising in collaborative policy design. And Holly was a 2010 Zonta International Jane M. Klautsman Women in Business District Scholar. So Holly, here we are. You have a master's now and a book on the go. How fabulous is that? I was just thinking, you know, when you said the year, I couldn't remember what year it was. I was lucky enough to get supported uh, by Zonta, but that was the year sort of while I was as, a, as an undergraduate deciding, oh, I might dabble in my first business and Zonta supported me to do that. And it's crazy to think uh, that it's been over, over 10 years since that all took place. I, I never would have imagined we'd be sitting here having this conversation, but I'm really grateful that we are. And, and I'm absolutely grateful that you've uh, chosen to join me today and our guests to have this conversation and for the people who will view it on recording. So, so let's begin. You, you have an amazing career to date and lots of professional achievements and they're inspiring to everyone around you. So I'd like to start with what and who motivated you to be this one woman dynamo who's a powerful influencer and speaker and a master questioner? Where did it all start? It definitely starts with my grandmother. I think um, she's always the, the woman that I've looked up to and 
kind of the main source of encouragement and and the and I think the most significant role model generally in my life. She was always the first person I turned to for advice, still is to this day. Um, and she, you know, she's been married to my grandpa 70 years. She just passed the 90 mark this March. Wow. And uh, she's a remarkable woman. And I've always said, if I can become a fraction of the woman that my grandmother is, I will consider myself successful. Um, but my grandma was just one of those great teachers. And she always taught by example, which I think is something that has become quite ingrained in me uh, as, as sort of a, yeah, great, you can say it, but how, what about what you practice, what you do? And, and that's become a big driving force, even a through line of the book is how do we put good ideas into practice? Or how do we challenge the, the existing status quo of bad ideas by putting new ideas into practice? But I remember quite vividly a moment when I was shopping with my grandmother and I would have been four or five years old. And we were, it's funny, those memories that stick in your head uh, and they're often ones that are quite jarring or that surprise you in a really significant way. But we were heading to the checkout to buy, it was uh, from memory, like a loaf of bread to go and make sandwiches for my brothers and I, you know, um, for lunch that day. And there was this man and he was a giant at that stage of my life. He probably was six foot, but he looked enormous to me. Mm. And evidently the uh, young girl who looked maybe all of 13 or 14 on the checkout had given him the wrong change. And he had absolutely laid into her and was being quite offensive in what he was saying to her, really berating her. And before I knew it, my grandmother, I should point out, is about five foot tall. My grandmother had inserted herself between this giant and this uh, young girl on the checkout and pointed her finger up at this guy and said, how dare you talk to that young lady like that? You apologize. And I remember him stopping in his tracks, sheepishly mumbling sort of, sorry, and then grabbing his things and running out of the store. And grandma sort of proceeded like nothing had happened, kept going, paid for the bread, turned around as she was exiting because I think she realized I wasn't standing next to her anymore because I was sort of rooted on the spot, just, you know, like a deer in the headlights <laughs> going, what just happened? And I just said to her, grandma, that was so brave. And I'll never forget, she said, honey, if you walk past it, you tell the world it's okay. And it was just one of those moments where my grandma, like that's a great lesson, but the fact that she had just done it made it carry all the more weight. Like that's a situation where a lot of people would walk past it because it's easier. Oh, is it my place? I might find myself in a sticky situation, et cetera. But my grandma just hadn't thought twice. That's not okay. You're disrespecting someone. You're picking someone who's a long way off your own size. You're picking on someone a long way off your own size. I'm going to do something about that. And when I look at my grandma, that trait and also the fact that irrespective of who you are, if you encounter my grandmother, she will make you feel like you are the most important person in the world and the world should be so lucky that you're here and that you've chosen to do what you've chosen to do with your life. And I always thought this incredible way she could make people feel seen and heard and as though they matter were these two mm. beautiful traits. And if, if I can get anywhere close to embodying them the way that my grandmother does, I'll be very happy. It's it's fascinating, isn't it? That that's one one episode from when you're a very small child and you've never forgotten it. In fact, it seems to underpin never. almost all that you do today. It's such a powerful Definitely, that and modeling. I think those lessons carry early. I mean, a lot of what we read is that some of the most powerful lessons and behaviors are shaped by the time we're 12. Uh, it's not mm. to say that, uh, you know, that can't change, but a lot of that early childhood le learning talks about how pivotal those early years are in particular mm. and how that neuroplasticity is just there like a sponge looking for the world to explain how it should mm. be making sense of things. So those early experiences that we give and, and we see that even when it comes to gender equality, right? We, we see these mm. attitudes set in where we ask young girls all of a sudden to draw what an astronaut looks like or what a CEO looks like and suddenly they're drawing men and you go wow how do we get more literature in front of them more stories more movies the work that you know the Gina Davis Institute is doing around trying to change the narratives we're putting in front of our young children so more boys and girls at that age are drawing both genders or um or genderless in the way that they think about leadership and identity and they draw teachers often as female they draw nurses often as female because they haven't yep. seen enough men particularly in primary they haven't seen often haven't seen enough men before them in the classroom um, and in a nurse situation as well and doctors, et cetera. It, it's really interesting how the brain absorbs that at a very, very early age, probably from the moment of birth. So, so we talked recently when I spoke to you about the importance of education and lifelong learning. Maybe that comes from my background as an educator and yours as well, and the dynamic exchange necessary between teacher and student. Perhaps you can explore this from your own experience and how education is the essential catalyst for progress on women's rights. 
Well, I think we sort of touched on it there, you mm. know, uh, in, in even talking about how pivotal, I guess there's two, two ways we can talk about education. It's formal education. And I am very grateful, you know, my, my first mentors were my, those early teachers. I was blessed to have some incredible educators in my life. And one of the most important things those educators did was they saw me for me and pushed me according to what they believed was my potential, as opposed to, you know, a a one size fits all of how a class should learn or operate, which I think was, was, I was so blessed to be in the room of educators who were so focused on being there in whatever way they could for each and every student. And I think the other thing was they really challenged me to learn outside the four walls of the classroom. They were always pushing me into extracurricular opportunities where either it was an extension or the learning was applied. So it was learning in context. Okay, cool. We've done a commerce unit. Now you're going to go run a business. Okay, cool. We've learned the practicalities of management. Hey, there's this school production going on. Why don't you run the entire production from a back of house standpoint and do ticketing and whatever and this and that. Um, so that applied piece, you know, a lot of leadership programs that they sent me on where it moved off the page and into practice. And, and that was something I, I look back on and go, you know, they were such formative moments that never would have happened to me had those educators not gone the extra mile filled out the form, nominated me for things, you know, allowed me to participate. So I think that was really, really important. And, and I remember my vice chancellor on my first day of the uni saying, at the end of your speech, if you leave with just a piece of paper here, we have failed you. If you haven't volunteered, if you haven't gotten involved in student groups, if you haven't taken internships, been involved in faculty organisations, we've let you down. That is what learning, that is what this period of life is for. And I thought that expansive way he described what the learning experience should be. I don't know why in my head it was so conventionally stuck within the four walls of the classroom, but it just really shattered that fourth wall and allowed me to take in learning in a, in a much, like I never would have had the experience I had at uni had I not heard that line. I was probably a kid that took it too far and did a lot more outside <laughs> the classroom than in it. Um, but I think the, the other thing that we, we know too is, like, you know, all the conversation we're having around the future of work speaks to the fact that we've all got to be lifelong learners now and this cycle of unlearning learning and relearning is something that we've all got to get really accustomed to and that's a very uncomfortable cycle it's not so something it, we're geared towards it's uncomfortable but I, I agree with you that there aren't any boundaries and I think that's the thing sometimes we can say oh well I might have like you just said I might have pushed it too far well I don't think we can push things too far in the educational space it doesn't matter whether your age my age or your grandma who's now in her 90s it's if she wasn't still learning she wouldn't be having a quality life and from what you're telling me she's having a quality life maybe you're maybe the tables have turned and you're giving input back to her because of all your experiences but I think it is that that two-way thing isn't it um, of learning from oh, everyone totally. around us every day. And one of, you know, I completely agree. And for me, it's about this notion of, and I always challenge myself to think, you know, how am I being a teacher and how am I being a student? So who am I sitting at the feet of and learning from and who am I um, sharing knowledge with and contributing to? And also how do I flip the paradigm of how that should traditionally work? Because I think the way that we think about teaching and mentoring is traditionally someone with more experience, more wisdom under their belt, teaching the person with less experience. You know, one of the big lessons for me in going through and researching for the book is a lot of these leaders of impact are learning from people that you wouldn't traditionally learn from. They're bringing people at the margins in to get their perspective, not people who traditionally be invited to the table. They're getting people who have lived experience of sleeping rough to come to the table mm. and help them design new homelessness, uh, homeless policies. Mm. They're talking to people that are a quarter of their age because they're wanting to be exposed to new business models and challenged on their mm. conventional thinking. Um, they're talking to people that come from a totally different cultural background to them because they want to be aware of how their cultural reality might impact the way they're thinking about rolling out a new idea or how a business model comes to life. So I think that notion of diversifying who we learn from and challenging ourselves on the settings in which we're doing the learning um, and the contributing. Because I think one of the, the guys I love, I, I featured him, he's uh, a great octogenarian here in Australia, a guy called Everald Compton. And he, he's sort of my, the youngest, he's, he's, he, he self-describes as the oldest millennial you'll ever meet. Um, but he's always on the go. And one of the things I like that was one of his mantras is it's, it's not just learning, it's contributing. 
So how are you putting your ideas into practice? He's always both reading, but also preparing presentations for government, engaging with local institutions, mentoring down at the primary school. You know, I, I think that kind of two-way conversation of contributing and listening is what we need. And what at what point in our lives do we actually see ourselves as taking and giving? And that's what we're talking about. We give back. We might continue to do what we choose to do when we're an octogenarian or a septuagenarian, et cetera. And we do that to give back. And we work with people like yourself. You know, I had some really interesting lessons from an eight-year-old recently that I was uh, in conversation awesome. with him during a school review. And I came away absolutely blown away by the intellect of this eight-year-old and how the school was going to work with this eight-year-old and others like him to to take them to the place that you are today. What is it the school has to do? And, and that's where Zonta plays an important role, particularly in some of our lesser developed countries, is, is opening education and making it accessible to all, because without it, we don't get there. So can I just move on? What else do you think needs to happen to make faster progress towards this elusive state of gender equality? I know uh, women in my age group have been working towards it for a very, very long time. So what do you I, think? I want to add to that point, just pay respect to everyone within the Zonta family. I know this has been something that's at the heart of what Zonta do and work towards. And so many of you across the world are volunteering on this absolutely critical mission. We still know how many young girls aren't being even primary school educated. So the importance of the work that we're doing in that regard, you, you don't have a chance to start a life if you can't get an education. You are you know, excluded from being able to in any way participate in society to be able to you know, engage in commerce in, in the way that the traditional structures are set. So I think that educational aspiration is such an important one and we're making ground, um, but we absolutely aren't where we wanna be in that regard. I think the other one that I've had a, a very big role in is the, the capital conversation. So just how important it is that we find ways um, to get more women uh, access to capital. You know, I was very fortunate to interview uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Muhammad Yunus a couple of weeks ago, um, the man who really pioneered microfinance with $27 out of his own pocket in Bangladesh. Now there are billions of dollars worth of loans out. And we had a conversation about the fact, why do 96% of loans go to women? because they're the ones where you, you change and empower a woman, you change an entire community. The way that that economic multiplier works to spread through entire villages, towns, countries is an absolute developmental game changer. I mean, it's probably been one of the most revolutionary ideas in, in development, you know, in the last generation. And I think what we still know, you know, fast forward to 2021 is there's still an extraordinary capital imbalance. It's fantastic that mm. organizations like this are so intentional about that in a developing world context, but let's put a developed country hat on for a second. About 4% of venture capital goes to female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's horrifying how low the stat is when we look at, you know, women of colour who are founders and things of that nature. So we've really, I think, got to do more to make sure the, the economics are working better for women. Um, and that includes everything, you know, from conversations around, uh, you know, just the, the very structure of uh, what the parental leave pay um, rights look like in, in a country, what superannuation looks like for countries that have those structures and how you support women and families making different life choices. Um, we've got a long way to go in some of those conversations and I'm intrigued. I think one of the things that was fascinating to me looking at from the outside in at the world of work prior to the COVID pandemic was just this incredible inability for a lot of the world to get its head around flexible working structures in a meaningful way. I feel like COVID has absolutely broken that conversation free. And I hope that that creates more opportunity for people to design work in a way that allows them to, um, to, to make it work for their life, their family wants, what fulfillment looks like for them. I hope that's also a moment of going, if we manage to do that in this instance, in a way that we never could have imagined, we could still run a business and make money or we could still, you know, achieve our organization's goals and have everyone working in this working from hybrid remote. <laughs> yeah, who would have thought that this who would have thought to challenge other sacred cows? But, but a lot of it comes from trust, doesn't it? Um, if organizations and individuals don't trust each other and trust their workforce to actually be productive when they're somewhere virtually, then until that trust develops, it's, it's, it's a very difficult space. Um, I think. And, and I, do, I think that, you know, one of the big things that was interesting to me researching the book is when you do the literature review, 
uh, as I did on a lot of these books here and, and others that's about leadership. It is overwhelmingly coming from the perspective of a privileged white male, Navy SEAL, sports coach, or like Jack Welsh type figure. There's a real absence of women shaping these conversations and therefore like the same extends to institutional design. You know, when you look at the origins of why are we working these nine to five working weeks? It's got a lot to do with the Ford Motor Company. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations where um, you've really got to think, and this is uh, one of the women I feature in the book, an uh, incredible anthropologist by the name of Gen Dr. Genevieve Bell, talks about the idea of we need to understand history in order to ask better questions. And so she says, if we need to go back and think about the room in which, and her example in the book is AI, Think about the conference in the 60s where this was designed, where they decided to not invite women, they decided not to invite minority voices, and they were predominantly focused on AI for the purposes of military um, scale. Yep. And you go, once and you understand that, you can ask better questions about who wasn't in the room, who, what biases might be built in, what purpose was this designed for, who didn't we think about or hear from in that process? And that can help us to unpick in order to redesign. And I think those kind of uh, kind of uh, intensive questioning processes are something we've got to put a lens over a lot of how we work at the moment. Yesterday I heard on our local radio national here in Australia, a discussion about trying to break and crash through the model of schooling, the structure of schooling. And there's one place in Australia where there's been some trials going on about the nine to three school day. There are many countries around our world who've never had a nine to three school day. You know, they have two sessions of schooling and they have it from 7.30 in the morning till one and all of these things. And in some of our advanced countries, um, in inverted commas, that, that discussion about smashing through what schooling looks like for children between prep and the end of secondary is a conversation that I'm hoping will follow COVID, the COVID crashing through the working day, because that's, that, that is for me in alignment with the working day, that what goes on that's in school. That's what I think Zonta can be such a great little microcosm for. I mean, you mentioned at the start 28,000 members across 68 countries. What a great set of uh, lenses to be able to put over what does best practice look like or what are alternatives to the way that it's traditionally done here and here that we can use to spark a new policy conversation or we can use to say, hey, it can work a different way. Should we give it a go and run a pilot? Um, there's this great little hotbed that we've got right here in this community that can be used to drive and start these change conversations all around the world. That's that's um, parts of the reasons that I work with Zonta and other organisations as you do to have that conversation. So, so let's move on. Can we talk about leadership? Uh, you've writ just written your book. Uh, you're a, a leader who emerged very early in your life as a child into adolescence and then as an adult. So talk about, to me, about leadership for you. What's, what do you think is important about your leadership style what are you as a leader? You often describe yourself as a thought leader, but just explore for our guests, our participants today, that notion of leadership from your perspective. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's one I've spent a lot of time thinking about of late in, in writing the, the book, The Leading Edge. Mm. And the real desire in writing that book was to challenge, as I just touched on there, this kind of one dimensional way that we talk about this single paradigm that seems to perpetuate the way that we teach leadership. It's not the way that we see leadership show up in the world. And that's one of the great things the book has given me the opportunity to do is showcase 60 plus leaders, you know, equal split of genders, 20 plus countries, every generation, all, all sectors, all different walks of life, because that is how leadership shows up. And we all know that. We see that it's present in this network. It's present through our networks in all sorts of different people who lead in a way that looks very different to what we see, like lionised in, in the books and in the textbooks in this respect. So I think for me, you know, we're, we're seeing a conversation evolving about leadership in part because of this growing dissatisfaction amongst people, whether it's the, the kind of declining trust levels that we're seeing with people across the world in their leaders, whether it's this lack of engagement we're seeing broadly in the Gallup surveys um, around work, uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer was the, the one I was referencing there. Um, and just in general, this notion, I think from a lot of people that there's, uh, we're, we're persisting with this model that's clearly not match fit for the challenges of 2021. Um, you know, we're, we're challenged by, you know, climate change, we're challenged by responding to a global pandemic. And across the board, you know, it was very interesting to be studying public policy in the last 12 months, because we've arguably never had a greater 
set of comparative data. And I think a lot of people have been left wanting in the way that they've seen their leaders respond. And there's also been examples of really phenomenally surprising leadership. You know, our frontline healthcare workers, my gosh, what incredible leadership has been demonstrated there. You know, from businesses who've taken up the charge to support people to pivot their business overnight and to providing masks or, or going from producing gin to producing hand sanitizer <laughs> and stepping in and trying to encourage and assist with vaccine rollouts. And so there's been these incredible pockets of light. And, and what I wanted to do was showcase these pockets of light and really challenge this notion that leadership needs to look or be a certain way. That if it doesn't happen at scale, if you're not running a Fortune 500 company, you're not really leading. Because I think that view was, has discounted or seen a lot of people discount themselves out of their ability to play a role as a leader. And what we really need is everyone stepping into their own power in their own way, whether that's just in the way that they lead their family, whether that's in the way that they lead their community organisation, their church, whether it's the way that they lead a country or a company. Um, so for me, you know, leadership in particularly in this day and age is, is definitely purpose led. Um, I think we're seeing that conversation really taking on a, a whole new degree, but it is about something more than just the bottom line. You need to give people a reason to get out of bed, something that they can get excited about that involves a, contr a contribution to better in whatever way that looks like. And I think you're seeing a lot of companies on that journey and you're seeing a lot of people voting with their feet too as consumers and as employees in that regard. Mm -hmm. I think there's an increasing focus on values-based leadership. So um, that idea of, um, you know, not just in the way that we're seeing leaders and people wanting to follow leaders who have that embodied in them, but also in this kind of growth of what they're terming the belief driven buyer. So customers increasingly saying, yeah, great, you have all these nice pretty things that you say, but when things get tough and you say you're about equality, what do you do? Do you take a stand in that country because they've denied women the right to do something? Do you all of a sudden come out and say, actually, we're going to actively put money and capital behind turning the vote on that issue because we don't think it's okay that that transgender policy exists? So we're seeing this increasing expectation set, I think, put on leaders and, and organisations. And a lot of what I've scored, explored are what are those trends, but also what are the, the practices we can learn from leaders who are currently navigating this effectively so that we ourselves can strengthen our own leadership capacity. Effectively, you know, the jungle gym or the, the gym for new leadership in terms of the skills and capabilities we need to be effective. And for from another perspective, that believing you are leading wherever you are leading that in the old language leading from any chair like you're a leader wherever you are and having women of all ages actually believe they have those attributes and skills and capabilities of leadership wherever they are and it's as you said it's not if you're leading uh, the free world or you're leading a large organization we all lead um, through our the power of our voice and that having a voice matters and for me getting to that 50% of women in the world having a voice, until we get there, we're, we're not going to get the economic uh, parity that we're chasing. And if you go back to World Economic Forum, their latest gender report, you know, it's something like 250 years before the world will have economic parity, let alone gender equality in 147 years or something. And where Australia sits, I know from our perspective as Australians, we'd like it to be much further up the, up the pole of... Um, progress with gender so it's very interesting you talk about a brave new leader can you just very quickly give a dot point of what does this brave new leader look like that we that you're talking about in your book and that we desperately need right now in our world what what do those leaders look like yeah, oh, well, they can look like anyone. And I think that's certainly one of the ideas I'm hoping to get across in the book. I think it's more about what they choose to do. Um, so they choose to question conventional wisdom um, and, and challenge, well, just because it's the way we've always done things, does it mean it's the way that we should continue to? You know, they, they ask those questions, they speak up and offer alternative ideas. They're prepared to step out and say, I'm not going to walk past that. I don't think that's okay. You know, for me, they're a leader who um, always chooses to do the next brave thing because we know bravery is not about a single moment. And I think sometimes that is, that's one of the things I probably learned doing research around the courageous leaders in the book is a, a misrepresentation I think we have is it's kind of concentrated in a single decision or a single moment, where in reality, it's, it's, it's leaning into these, these moments, micro moments all the time. And it's mm -hmm. always choosing to do that brave thing that in, in lines with what you believe from a values base, from purpose base, 
the right course of action should be. And sometimes those moments are quiet. I think it's really important we move away from the notion that every demonstration of leadership is extroverted. It's not. Um, but it, it, sometimes those moments are quiet. Sometimes those moments are loud. But they're always there's, there's always a choice. And and brave leaders are the ones who always choose the the path of most resistance when it needs to be chosen. Um, because it is the path of least resistance is to keep doing things the way that we've done them. And in this world where COVID and the pandemic and the way it's hit countries has shown up even more cracks in the place of women and what it's like to be a woman in this world, it seems to, it's really, in my opinion, almost shattered some of the progress we'd made to find where it is. And we still find that, you were talking about it earlier, that women over 55 uh, in our country in particular are um, the highest group at risk of homelessness. And that comes out of yeah. that economic um, economic issue that you were talking about earlier. But these impacts have shown up. What do you think these brave new leaders, all of us, need to do to make a difference for women in particular going forward? You've talked about the policy frame because there's a lot of work to go on in government policy frame. Mm -hmm. But what do you think the brave new leaders can do, particularly in that space, to recover and move forward again with gender? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And you're right. I mean, there's not many of us who've read any report on any aspect of women's experience through the pandemic um, that have seen good data. You know, it, it, when you look at um, particularly the, the stats I saw recently around the number of women who left the US workforce, um, mm. you know, at the start of this year, just in terms of the the caring responsibility burden and this um, this challenge of straddling, obviously, the, the current situation when you're caring for either children or parents or people that were, were sick and ill with COVID, you know, in your respective lives, it, it's extraordinarily challenging. Um, as I said, I have hope that we can open the door to a new conversation around what work can look like off the back of the pandemic, because it has proven business, that, uh, proven to business and business leaders that it doesn't need to look the way that it once did. I am finding it fascinating though, with just the touch points I have across organisations, how many are rapidly defaulting to the way that we did things pre-pandemic in post-pandemic life. And so I think playing a role in those conversations and just halting that, you know, it's almost that need to, hey, let's breathe for a moment. Let's reflect on, you know, let's not return to things that weren't serving us. Let's try and open the conversation to our people because quite often, what's convenient for the leader of the organisation is a very different story to what's convenient for the people in an organisation and imposing decisions in that post-COVID structure versus, you know, surfacing them, I think are, are two really different approaches there. So I think there's a big role we can play in those conversations in a very local context, like where we live and work, as much as there is in shaping the national conversation in that regard. I think the other thing for me, and, and those who were at the, the Yokohama conference a few years ago will remember me talking quite passionately about this. There is a, a huge worry that I have regarding the kind of the, the restructuring of economies globally. And I mean, and the acceleration too, that the COVID pandemic brought up to that. So, you know, you saw Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft say that, you know, there was a three, four month period in the pandemic last year where tech acceleration jumped about two years forward on, on the progress we were anticipating. I mean, arguably that's intensified because the, the tail of the pandemic is proving long and we're continuing to sit in this kind of augmented hybrid recovery at the moment. And in that regard, I worry significantly because we all know the stats about girls and STEM. We all know that girls are not studying and graduating from science, technology, engineering and maths. And not even the, the graduation part that in a lot of regards, it, it, there's about a literacy too. I was having this conversation with a few senior um, IT executives from across Europe last week. They were talking about, you know, there's there's a need to be literate in it, even if you're not necessarily the someone who's chosen to go and do a coding degree or someone who's chosen to be an IT specialist in any way, shape or form. And I really worry that our gender equality statistics will get worse as businesses move from being a business in manufacturing, a business in whatever, to effectively everyone being a technology business that happens to do X. So I think that importance of that lifelong learning piece, irrespective of where people are in their career, giving them access into the skills that they require as board directors to be able to meaningfully contribute to a technology conversation to understand it, delve into the data, acknowledge the risk and discharge their risk responsibilities as a director is going to be really important to get more women on boards. 
you know, at an executive level, we're going to see understanding that and being able to drive technology business units and technology businesses being a really important. So how are we opening up access to that learning? And I think we are, I don't think we've made an enormous amount of progress based on the data in the last five, 10 years of this conversation on getting women in STEM at a high school level. But the other thing I worry about is, okay, what about all the people that have already left? How are we doing that lifelong learning part for people that are between 25 and 65? Um, because they're not tapped into traditional institution. They've not necessarily in their fabric of experience or study to date studied that. And I really think one of the big challenges for us to tackle is how do we partner? And there are some great organisations we could think about doing that with, but how do we pull together a patchwork quilt of kind of the, the informal learning journey you can do to skill up in that area? I think that's going to be absolutely critical for the, the future of equality and making sure that's as broad as we can and the accessibility that gives to the developing world as much as it does the developed world. And it's at, at, at all places in the age spectrum, isn't it? Like, uh, I've, I'm one of those people you speak about where it wasn't part of my life until somewhere in my, I don't know, 20s or 30s and, and trying to get the skills and capability you need to just navigate the world from that whole STEM space. And if you've not studied or know it, and I read some statistics recently where one of the largest um, group that is engaging in new knowledge around that whole IT world, if we just go into IT, is uh, people who are retiring or thinking of retiring. So people who are 55, 60 plus uh, to get into the virtual world, to understand it, because everything, everything requires you to be able to do something online. And it's really scary for people who've not done it before. And girls, uh, girls in STEM was a problem when I was teaching back in the 70s and 80s, let alone now. And, and it's really concerning as to how we um, change the um, stereotype, isn't it? It's about changing stereotypes and hearts and minds. There's a lot of work to go. Um, can I and, move you know, on? Even to your point there, sorry. Lynn, sorry, one quick one. You just made me think as well, you know, when we think about the move you know, post-pandemic to a cashless economy and the acceleration of that mm -hmm. and what that does to our unbanked population and what percentage of that mm -hmm. unbanked population are women, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's an mm -hmm. example of one of those hybrid challenges between capital and tech. Mm -hmm that we've really got to lean into because it that that will not be on the priority radar of some people in the way it certainly should be those of us who are questing for gender equality. Yes, like, oh, I need to have a credit card and I need to be able to do this, I need to be able to do that and, and manage it. And, you know, we're not here to talk about it today, but the whole issue of managing cybersecurity with your children, all of those things are facing today's parents and grandparents, because so many grandparents are caring for their children and they need to know um, all of those issues that young people are facing, and particularly with cyber security and, and managing their lives. It's quite different from even when you were a child, you know, that the mm -hmm. amount of, that was probably never talked about. So in your um, professional life to date and personal life to date, you've talked about the influence of your grandmother. The importance of mentoring. Have you had other mentors and what's your view on mentoring and have you got any wisdom you'd share with today's participants about the whole notion of mentoring and the importance of it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been so blessed to be incredibly well mentored and it's one of the things I often say I'm, in, I'm truly grateful for because it's been the single biggest contributor, I think, to my growth and development as a person and as a leader. Like I wasn't someone who grew up with people in my family, like immediate family, who encouraged questions around the dinner table. And so I was very grateful. I always had grandparents that did that and were really big supporters of that curiosity. I was really grateful for educators who were mentors long before I knew what that word was. And then increasingly, as I stepped out into my career, you know, it was um, so many people, I mean, some people who really took me under their wing, but so many more who provided ad hoc advice or were happy to sit down and offer insights and share from their experience. So I'm a big proponent of mentoring. I'm a big proponent though, um, you know, when, when people ask me, um, uh, how did you kind of make it work for you? And, and those sorts of things. I am very, very cautious that mentoring brings up a lot of feelings for people. And by that, I mean, often people have had a really bad mentoring experience because they've been in some organization where they decided to launch a mentoring program and everyone got automatically paired with someone and that wasn't necessarily done with the greatest degree of thoughtfulness 
Um, and, and so there's, there's legacy issues or there's a level of formality that I think that term can sometimes trigger. There's also, it's a very interesting conversation I've only found myself in recently with female executives who really think that the way mentoring is being deployed, at least the way it's coming up for con in conversations for them in a corporate setting, is um, a very masculine approach. And I think it is often something that is the soul for why we don't have more women. Oh, we need a mentoring program. And so I'm really not talking about that. And I think that's interesting. And I want to unpack that more with the women who shared that with me last week that that's the reality of how a lot of people are meeting that conversation. I think for mm -hmm. me, um, I've always gone and sought learning uh, and I've always sought to try a, a, a great mentor of mine very early on stage at a, a leadership program. I found myself out at 19 in Los Angeles. So this great line, how long does it take to learn from someone's lifetime of experience? Mm -hmm. I was sort of crickets in the room. And then he answered his own question. He said, coffee, all it takes is coffee. Like, all you've got to do is, you know, ask these people who have done what you want to do or are you really admired if you can buy them a cup of coffee. And I was just someone, I don't know why that struck a lightning bolt, but it all of a sudden just made that learning so accessible that I thought, I can do that. Like, anyone can do that. So I sort of made a commitment to myself that I would do that once a week from that point forward and just seek out people that I had a real reason why to make time with, because I think it's really important. People's most important thing is their time and we shouldn't be flippant about it um, and just reach out and explain why I wanted to connect, what I was hoping to learn and whether they'd have time to sit down and have a, a conversation. And my view was always to seek the learning conversation. If that then had the right dynamic in the conversation where I felt like I barely scratched the surface of what I would love to have learned and we had a, the right dynamic, sometimes you don't, uh, then I would often say, would it be possible that I could circle back once I've taken this advice on and applied it and we could have another conversation? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's kind of been the approach that I've taken to mentoring. I, I think it's certainly in the way it's played out in my life, it's been a very positive thing. As I said, I'm very wary of institutional mentoring uh, and I think it needs to be done with the right intention uh, and in the right way. But I think it as a tool for assisting with informal learning is unbelievably powerful. So when the going gets tough, Holly, because we're coming close to, you know, doing some questions and wrapping event in the next 10 minutes or so, when the going gets tough, what do you do or who do you go to to boost your, your confidence and your resilience in those moments where you might question or whatever happens for you? What do you do? place a lot this week so it's very top of mind um I, I've kept repeating I've just been reading this book Untamed by Glennon Doyle uh, a name that might be very familiar to some of our mm. American listeners in particular and uh, there's this great line in the book that says uh, where she talks about this mantra she developed during hard times in her life which said we can do hard things so I've repeat I've been repeating we can do hard things a lot to myself this week uh I think I've I've drawn quite widely I think part of knowing what to do in hard moments comes from knowing yourself. And I, um, I got this very wrong. Uh, so I, I massively hit a wall uh, in what would have been 2013, really had to rebuild kind of the scaffolding and, and the people that were in my life and everything like that. Uh, and I think I learned a lot of lessons in getting it wrong, but I wish I could have avoided, but have helped me to get it right now. And one of the things I learned about myself during that time is just understanding the way that I process the world. I process the world out loud. So I am someone that's kinesthetic <laughs> in the way that they process. And so I, I need to have people that I can talk to about things to work through them. I'm not someone who left to their own devices in their own head or, you know, um, writing things out or something is going to have the same cut through or ability to move through something. But my velocity is quite quick when I can talk it out. So I think for me, it's become really important knowing who those people are that I can trust that I really have values alignment to. So when they give me advice, I know it's congruent with the way that they've got my best interests at heart. I see the world in a similar lens. So that's been really important. Um, I think it's also knowing what your circuit breakers are. So what can actually help you break negative thought patterns or not feeling good? For me, a big one for that is exercise. And mm -hmm. so putting my shoes on and going for a run or a walk and getting out in nature and moving is probably the best way I know to snap out of a, of a mood and, and, and anything in that regard. But I think they're probably, there's no magic bullet, as all of us know, for how to kind of, you know, get yourself feeling instantly better. Um, but I think I have learned that it's a lot about understanding yourself, 
And then in general, in terms of avoiding getting in those states, though they're, you know, often unavoidable, my big one, my biggest game changer since I got it all wrong has been learning to manage my energy, not manage my time and structuring my days and weeks according to energy management, not time management. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't read The Power of Full Engagement, I really encourage you to read that book. Uh, It was absolutely game changing for me in terms of redesigning the way that I structured my any given day and week and being really intentional around uh, the energy building blocks. So what it is that energizes you and how you make sure that's in every day. One of the books, uh, one of the ideas I explore in the book that I hope will, will bring some new thought to this topic is the notion of micro breaks and this whole wave of um, clinicians now who are telling us we've actually almost been a limited to ourselves in believing, oh, if you can't meditate for 20 minutes, it's not worth doing. If you can't do the hour exercise class, it's not worth doing. Whereas all the data is showing up that there's the ability to make like general, um, like proven mm-hmm. as in viewable on wearable technology, physiological changes in yourself with doing something as simple as getting up and doing 10 squats and 10 power jumps or sitting there and breathing 10 deep breaths. Mm-hmm. So I'm very interested now in playing with the idea of micro breaks and those ability to provide those momentary circuit breakers we often need access to as well. And I'm sure with all the work you do around the schools and schooling sector, uh, you'll see that happening. It's a very big thing in many schools that I am in contact with. They have micro breaks for kids, particularly, I should say children, between uh, the beginning of school and the middle of the day. And it might be every hour or so. And the children always are encouraged to have fruit or vegetables all chopped up and or have an apple and you'll see them have a five minute or a 10 minute break. Um, that they only go outside a short way, then they're back in the room or they might have that break even in the room. And that's something that as adults, perhaps we should be applying. Uh, Mm. It's a very interesting place to go about that energy versus time. Uh, That's something I've learned from you today, today. So this is all about what we take away from each other. Uh, As I start to get closer to the end of our conversation this morning, Holly, and I could do this for another hour and, and you don't have that time and probably neither do our listeners today, you're a role model, you're very visible. You are indeed that remarkable woman we talk about in this series. What are your greatest gifts? Top three or four, what do you think are your greatest gifts? Uh, thank you, firstly. Um, what would I say to that? I think my curiosity, uh, my insatiable curiosity is probably one of them. Uh, another one would probably be, I, I think, I have a skill in in synthesizing complexity, in making uh, things and cutting through or getting to the, the nub of something or being able to help other people to do that. And that's one of the things I love doing on stage, you know, and, and I see myself as being able to be a bridge between some of those conversations that happen at far too highfalutin a level and in a way that's almost intentionally designed to be complex so it keeps people yes. out and then making them accessible because we should all be involved in conversations mm-hmm. that matter to us and for us. Mm-hmm. And then I would probably say my grandma has always described me as being in perpetual motion <laughs> and I think there, there is probably something about the, the, the drive that I have and the you know, I get up every day and I know that every rotation we get around the sun is precious and I try and make sure I am doing something meaningful for the world with that. And uh, I'm, I feel that's, that's a, a gift to have that drive to do better um, in every day. Uh, and I see you as energy or, dyna- or dynamic. So in, in the interactions I've had with you personally, uh, that, yeah, that resonates back out as well. So thank you. Zonta, Zonta, it's my pleasure. Zonta envisions the world where women's rights are equal rights and recognises human rights and there's that true gender parity. How do you think, see things changing for women in the next decade? If you just fast forward another 10 years, how do you think it will change? Because we talk about what needs to change, but honestly, how do you think it will change? Isn't it? I mean, that's the extraordinary thing about moments like this is we sit on the precipice of a world or a juncture in the road where you could head at a a whole bunch of different forks. You know, it's interesting because in many ways, the pandemic has showed up the strength of women's leadership, the best countries in terms of their response to COVID, whether we're looking at it even as a, you know, state and provincial level in terms of vaccine rollouts in the US right through to global leadership. 
have been oftentimes where women have been in leadership positions, where women are running the country, they're running the county, they're running the state. So there's been some phenomenal examples, the importance of women in leadership. But as we've touched on this conversation too, there's, it's also brought with it a whole set of new threats um, to Mm -hmm. women's ability to participate uh, to the economic model that wasn't working for women already, that has been exacerbated by the conditions the pandemic has thrust the world into. So, I mean, the the big thing is how it turns out in the next 10 years is on how we rally, how we influence, you know, how we all play a role and how we, you know, recruit a lot more people to be a part of helping us do this too. Um, Mm. And we put pressure on these policy decisions that are going to be made. You know, we're constantly having these conversations around how do we build back better and the intentionality we need to have in how we restructure economies and countries and energy systems and everything after the pandemic we've got really important roles to play in in shaping this. And I think similarly to how we have seen the pandemic play out, and that is very unequally, you know, that great quote, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. It's been a very unevenly distributed response to the pandemic. I mean, we are, we're still in it here, Lynn, in in, uh, Australia. We are a long way off being vaccinated. Talk to colleagues of mine in America, they're out the other side, maskless, vaccinated, back traveling to Europe again. And at the same time, we can look at two colleagues over in India and, and in parts um, of you know, Africa and go, wow, we are such a long way off getting in progress and getting to where we need that part of the world to be. So my worry is that we will see a similar kind of splintering. I know mm-hmm. the women's rights aren't equal across the world now, but I feel like we might see very different response rates and very different accelerations or decelerations of progress. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I hope is we can find the right vehicles to still continue to progress and work together and be mm-hmm. supporters. There's why organisations like Zonta Matter, you know, that international coalition of women mm-hmm. is really critical um, because those points of light need to help shine a light on areas where there's going to be increasing darkness in the next decade. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have unwavering optimism, you know, when I think about, and I have conversations with, you know, my grandma about this stuff all the time, you know, she grew up, I was a nurse in the polio, you know, pandemic and, you know, had to, was only ever really allowed to be a typist or a nurse, had to leave work when she married my grandpa. The, the realities of her world, she can't fathom the choices that are in front of me. Um, mm. And I can't, I hope I'm having that conversation with my granddaughter one day. Um, mm. And that's what, drives me is that want to pass the baton in the way that my grandmother has passed that world to me and the shoulders of the giants that we stand on the suffragettes the women who have played such a pivotal role opal lee in the context of juneteenth this week these amazing women who have been such incredible crusaders we've got that responsibility to make sure that progress isn't lost in this next decade and and that's certainly a fight that i'm all in for so where's it? you've got an incredible uplift in the power of your voice coming when the leading edge hits hits the market on the 20th of July. What's the next uplift for you in your voice and the power of your voice to make this difference you're talking about? I think it sort of remains to be seen. Um, I'm, I'm excited to get the book out there. I think one of the things you never know about books is where it will meet the world who it will meet in the world and the conversations that might start I'm extremely passionate about how we raise up the next generation of leaders and I don't use that in an age sense I'm not talking about 20 year olds here I'm talking about anyone who is saying I want to be the change I want to see in the world how do I do it that's my group of people that I want to work with and play a role in supporting and I would love to think about how the book could turn into, you know, a leadership academy or an institute and we mm. could connect people all around the world and help give this skill set over. Mm. And it, like the way I describe the book is it's not intended to be, uh, you know, this, this perfect set of principles. I'm not kind of preaching from a leadership mount by any stretch. It's a collation of these great stories, but it's, it's something you should treat like your favourite recipe. You know, play with it, try it on, go, oh, that's really interesting and I liked it, but next time I'd add raisins in or I'd take out, like, you know, a teaspoon of honey or whatever it might be. And I want it to be that level of dynamic because that's what we need. We need leadership that can keep pace with the challenges in front of us and that we can continually be experimenting with that's not static. So I'm hoping there will be something that emerges in that space. There's a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. One is um, one of our participants today is saying that, um, back thread 30 or 40 years ago, she and her husband were doing the part-time working as parents, so they each had more time with the children. 
Uh, you see that a little bit where both parents are doing part-time to have more time with the children. Do you think that's a possibility that might work in the future? And a big evolution in uh, parental leave policies. We're increasingly seeing people take gender off that too. Obviously, we've got a lot more same-sex parents now as well. Um, and we've just got a, I think, a view that it's parental leave, it's not maternity leave, because we absolutely want fathers to be home with children as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as much, and I think this is a conversation I find in with myself and with male colleagues all the time. You know, a lot of the progress we're talking about is as much about a conversation about feminism as it is about masculinity and the progress we need um, in the way that we raise our boys and our young men um, and the, the evolution that we need to see in that regard and the way that we need to support them institutionally as well because you know some of these structures right now uh, are very constraining to be able to on the flip side support what we as women want so I was actually listening to um, a Supreme Court podcast recently and just some of that pioneering thinking of RBG in the way that she sort of mm. flipped and used these men's rights cases as a way of advancing women's rights. Mm. I'm intrigued by how that might show up in the here and now. Absolutely. There's another question there. Have you ever thought of politics <laughs> yourself? <laughs> About a dollar for every time I got asked, asked that. I really don't know where that question comes from, but it does come a lot. Uh, I would I would not do that to my family. Um, I would not do that to my partner and I would not do that to the kids that we hope to have um, one day, I, I just think for, I, be, I believe that more change right now comes from outside the system than in, and this is speaking in our context in Australia, I, I'm not sure the, the nationality of the questioner, but I think everyone everyone's situation is a little bit circumstantial, but I don't believe our political system is a vehicle for change right now. I understand its role in systems change, but I think you can influence that from the outside. And I think most of the inspiring leadership would love to be proven wrong. But at this point, I would say the, the leadership in our country over the next decade is going to come from corporate and civil society. And that came from Europe, that question. So, yes, there's another one here about... Faith in European government. <laughs> yeah, so there's another question here about um, in order to break the cycle around uh, gender and the gender inequality, um, Julie is talking about breaking the cycle through educating males or getting men involved in the uh, the journey towards gender equality. And I know I always talk about the absolute importance of it's a partnership. Um, women, it's not just women's work, but I wondered what your perspective on that is. I think, yeah, absolutely. We need everyone involved in this conversation. It's that evolution of these women's rights to human rights, you know. Um, so I, I could not agree more. And I think every initiative that we're doing to um, broaden the tent in terms of who it is that feels both a part of the conversation and responsible for the outcomes of the conversation too is absolutely mm. critical. So I think that works fantastic. The next one comes from my partner who's watching and listening this morning. That's how I get my critical feedback for improvement um, in the process. God bless him. Uh, so Ray's asked a question. From the discussion, it appears major events, emergencies or major change brings out and provides a scene for strong women to rise to the task. Do you think this is true? I mean, that's without question one of the stories of the pandemic. And I think, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention and women are extraordinarily inventive. Um, mm -hmm. And they have been for centuries in the way that they have been able to, you know, respond to whatever the given circumstance were and support and encourage and advance and mm -hmm. care and lead in any, any different environment. So I completely agree. Um, and I... I just wish we were given the chance to lead when it wasn't crisis. <laughs> and I think that's, that's one right. of the important things is, you know, these proven capabilities that arrive when we need them, fantastic. Mm. But how come there's not more consistent, um, you know, leadership roles, um, seats, et cetera, for women? So, yes, without a doubt, Ray, I like that question. Um, and I think that's one of the one of the through lines of the pandemic story. I also call it um, triage leadership or hospital leadership, um, role the strong woman in to to fix it up and then and we go from there but that's only my personal viewpoint we'll need to go to a wrap right now there's another last question is about how do you deal with gender inequality i think you've probably answered that holistically in our best part of an hour together this morning holly is there anything you'd like to add and then i'm going to ask you to give a, a final reflection that you would like to leave the audience with and we've already uh, put the link for your book that's to pre-order for the 20th of July, The Leading Edge, but some wrap-up question and maybe cover off on the gender inequality and in dealing with it. 
because I'm conscious of the the busy leaders that I'm talking to. Uh, I would say I, I call it out. I find the right way to do so, and I think you can have different levels of effectiveness depending on the circumstance in how you're going about calling it out. Sometimes it's there in the moment. Sometimes you're working on a far bigger institutional redesign depending on the nature of what's going on but finding a way to make sure you don't walk past it is, is my big thing on any form of inequality whether it's racial whether it's uh, you know homophobic whether it's um, gender inequality you know anything that's going on that doesn't sit right with the way that you view the world I think that's really important uh, and I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who joined this conversation and Lynn for all the effort you've put into preparing for it I, a lot I, I think we should never underestimate what starts in conversation and what starts with the questions that we ask. And I think we're in a period of time where we need to be very forensic, um, curious questioners um, and show up with an intent that when we, we listen and get the answers, we're prepared to do something about them um, because they, they're going to reveal things that um, we need to change. They're going to reveal things that aren't the way they should be. A lot of times we know that and we're seeking confirmation, but um, I think I just want to encourage and embolden all of you. I think what Zonta does is so important. I'm very grateful for the support that you've given me and I'm very grateful for all that you do for women worldwide. So I just hope um, to continue to see Zonta move onward and upward and to, to continue to play its important role within the, the global push for women's rights. Thanks so much, Holly. And thank you for um, acknowledging the role of Zonta in the world. Um, for all the things that we're all working towards and have always been. Um, I know that we get a lot of people who listen to and watch the recording. So sometimes we have a smaller group because of the time, you know, it's now past midnight in Europe and coming into dinner time in the US So and work time in Australia. So there's never a good time globally, is there? But um, our, our recordings are available on YouTube and they'll be posted on our website shortly and anyone who's registered will get that link and I'll certainly pass it to you, Holly, if you wish to give it to your grandma or anybody else in your family who wasn't able to watch you today. But we certainly get lots and lots and more than 100 or 200 people come back to the recording. And so for us, it's important uh, to get our messages out there and through uh, wonderful, remarkable women with powerful stories such as yourself. So I do thank you so much for the preparation. You gave me your time a month ago and you've given us the time today in the preparation. And as, as I predicted, we wandered through a range of topics in all sorts of orders. And I do thank you for your flexibility and thank you so much for sharing everything that you think and are reflecting on. And I know many of us will be very interested to read your book. I've recently read Julia Gillard's book, Julia and a, Con a, a, a Negozi, a Con a Conjo Whaler's book, Women in Leadership, which is um, a, a fabulous read and yours is coming on the back of um, books such as that. So thank you so much for your authorship of what's coming. And thank you for today and being a really strong friend of the Zonta family and being part of our family. We appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. So I'm just wrapping up the series. I wanted to remind everyone of the importance of the Zonta Foundation, Zonta International Foundation for Women and how important that is for the raising of money and to support all of the programs that we've been talking about today. The next event is on the 28th of July at 4 p.m. US Central Daylight Time. And of course, here in Australia, that's 7 a.m. on the 29th and at various times um, between that in Europe, late in the night in Europe, in Europe. So my guest is Felicia Davis, who's the president and CEO of the Chicago Foundation for Women. And during that time, we will certainly be pursuing more threads and more ideas and more thoughts on the matter of gender equality and the leadership and how that can be taken forward in our world. She's a self-described girl from the South Side and deeply committed to community through inclusive service to others in her role with the Chicago Foundation for Women. And she leads their efforts in investing in women and girls as catalysts building stronger communities. She's very passionate about transforming lives and has, an, has had an amazing career, including in the Chicago Police Department and in many other ways around her city and, and influencing the future around the, the broader area of Chicago. So I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Felicia um, on the 28th of July 
in um, US time. So thank you very much for being present today. Spread the word to all your friends and colleagues, and I look forward to seeing you in July. Thank you once again, and thank you to my support team at Zonda headquarters in Chicago.